Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to Selling ODAs to Governments and Offensive Security Companies in Islander EI. Um, we have today with us uh, Mayor Schwartz. First off, I'd like to do a little uh, housekeeping. Um, stop by the business hall located in Mandalay Bay, Oceanside and Shoreline Ballrooms on level two. Black Hat Arsenal is running in the business hall on level two as well. Lunch will be served today in Bayside AB from 1 to 2.30. Uh, and don't forget to swing by the merchandise store down on level two. So I thank you to put your uh, cell phones on uh, vibrate and welcome Mayor. Hi everyone, thank you very much for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. Today we're going to talk about selling zero days to government and offensive security companies. A little bit about myself, I work as a vulnerability broker in the past four years. Started my way at Beyond Security SSD program. Uh, great company, highly recommended to work with. And then I founded my own company called Curiecon that focused on uh, offensive security companies and government. In addition to that, my day-to-day -day job, I work as a cyber researcher in the insurance industry in Japan. What we're going to talk about today. So we're talking about who is this talk for, uh, a little bit about my story, um, then we'll go the overview about the zero day process and a little bit about the history. Who is selling zero days? How, what, what, what is the process of selling it? How to sell it? And of course, tips and tricks. So is this talk is for you. It, uh, my talk is not a technical talk or a deep dive into the brokerage world. I will explain you um, about the, my experience in this industry. And of course, I will help new researchers that want to step into the market to have the guidelines that they need. A little bit about my story. As I, al I already mentioned, I founded my own company called Curicon. Uh, I focused solely on governments and offensive security companies. I started it small uh, with few researchers that I work with and a few clients. And after a couple of really successful deals or transaction, such as helping researcher to find job or actually selling zero days, I started to get more and more attention. The problem is that I got on some of the major players in the industry on the radar, and unfortunately they threatened me and made me stop and close my company. Uh, but it's not really the end. So let's start about the overview about the zero day industry. In traditional software uh, developers or de software companies, there is a, a technological problem that if you invest enough time and money, eventually you will have the product and the solution for it. Meaning if you, it, it won't be the best product maybe, but you will still have a solution in the product. But when we're talking about zero days or vulnerabilities, we're talking about a form of art. It's, it's more difficult to find vulnerabilities and it doesn't matter if you spend millions of dollars into, to find vulnerabilities, but if you don't have the talent and the researchers that are capable of finding them, so in the end you, you will, get, uh, will get with nothing. So it's really important to understand that it's really difficult to find it, uh, the high-end vulnerabilities, and we will talk about it in a second, and it's a form of art. In the past five years, the zero-day industry changed dramatically. We are talking about decreased numbers of players from brokers to companies to governments that try to buy vulnerabilities from the open market. We have more conferences more than ever. Like every day in the year, we have different conferences around the world. And bug bounty programs are basically anywhere today. And the one thing that I really want you to take from this slide is stepping, off the, stepping out of the shadow. Five years ago, if you want to sell vulnerability, it was in a dark alley and you didn't talk about it with anyone. But today more and more companies, more and more researchers say openly that they are dealing with zero days, that they are willing to acquire them. And we have different websites and different competition and we can see them more and more and that's why we're stepping out of the shadow. What that's really new in the past three or four, four years. Who is interested in zero days? Uh, the different, there are different communities that are interested in vulnerabilities and each one of them has a different need. Uh, this is the traditional way of looking at that, right? We have the white hats, the gray hats, and the black hats. But this is the traditional more kind of way to look at things. But who is buying what? Because each, com each, each community has different needs. We'll start with the white hats because we need to talk about them a little bit. According to HackerOne report from 2018, uh, there, are, there are more than 166,000 registered hackers. 
they submitted more than 72,000 vulnerabilities, but the majority, more than 70%, were focused on web vulnerabilities, XSS and CRFs. And we can see that the same, the same thing happened in 2019. There are more, there are more researchers out there, but they are, uh, they are submitted more vulnerabilities, but they are solely focused on web and low hanging fruits, meaning easy to find, quick and easy money, just to make a living, basically. But it's not just HackerOne, Backcrowd has the same report as well. The majority, like the most paid uh, vulnerability paid in 2018 was for XSS. In 2019, it's the same thing all, all over again. So there are a lot, of a lot of researchers out there, a lot of vulnerabilities, but the majority of them are low hanging fruits. But it's not, it's not just them, right? We also have the high-end researchers that fi they find high-end vulnerabilities. But they're either ideology motivated or PR motivated. They're working in a big firms like uh, Project Zero, Keen Lab, or Vulcan 360. Just an example, there are a lot more than them. And if I will try to summarize the White Hat's community, so a lot of researchers, the majority of them focus on long-hanging fruits, and if they have like high-end researchers, they are either ideology or uh, PR motivated. Let's talk about the other two groups. That this, this is basically the focus on, of this talk, right? So what are the high-end market? What those companies, the offensive security gov uh, companies and governments are looking to? So um, this list of products is regularly what's in demand in the market today. On the right side, we have the fat unicorn that's supposed to represent us the more unique kind of vulnerabilities. For example, zero clicks, RC and IMs, uh, WhatsApp, uh, iMessage, Chrome, etc. They are quite unique, and you can see them maybe once a year. Um, but again, this is the, what we, when we're talking about what in demand from companies and governments' perspective, we're talking about those lists. From the research perspective, uh, major, the majority of researchers think that they, they can sell only end products, but in reality, they can sell more than that. If I were a researcher, I think that this is the, the service map that I will offer because I can sell end products, and we'll go over it in a second, and services, then this is really important to understand. Let's start with the end product because it's, again, easy to understand. We have the vector, meaning a combination of different vulnerabilities that allow me to remote code execution, local privilege escalation, and persistency, and then we have, you can buy uh, individual vulnerabilities, such an RCE or LPE, et cetera. But the majority of researchers do not know that you can also sell the components in chain, meaning that you can sell infolix or in mitigation bypass. And, and, and offensive security companies and governments are actually looking to buy those things as well. From the service perspective, we have the dedicated research, meaning a company or government can outsource the research process to individuals or other companies to do that. There is a different pay methods and everything, and I will go through that in a few slides. There is also workshop, but workshop we can see them in a little bit different way, because here in Black Hat we also have quite a lot of workshops, right? But in the zero day market, we also have workshops that are dedicated to offensive security companies and governments. They pay a lot more and the domain is much more advanced than the average workshop that we can see in conferences. Consulting is another way. For example, a new company wants to step into a new domain and they want someone that is master of it and can, so they can ask question about this specific domain. So consulting is part of it. And of course, we also have the regular support, meaning uh, exploit uh, vulnerability to older versions, to new version, to combine them with other vulnerabilities, etc. I mentioned that there are governments and offensive security companies, but there are sub, uh, sub, um, sub groups, thank you, some groups inside of them. If we'll look at that, uh, we'll start with the offensive security companies because it's easier to understand. There are, you have two types of security companies. The first one sell product, meaning a full infrastructure end-to-end -end that usually sold only to governments. Um, it's contained the vulnerabilities, the malware, the proxies, the infrastructure, and of course the intelligent, uh, the intelligent 
uh, software that allow you to exfiltrate the intelligence you want from your target. On the other hand, we have uh, security companies that are knowledge-based, meaning they, so they solely so sell vulnerabilities and exploits. Usually they will give you support for all their newer, newer versions, and that's basically it from the offensive security companies. On government, on the other hand, we have the incapable countries and incapable countries. I will we'll start with incapable country. Let's make a an, an, uh, made up example. I am the, um, I don't know, X country and I don't have a research team. And someone wants to sell me or even give me for free an RC to Chrome. But in fact, I don't have a research team, so I really don't know what to do with that. Meaning I lack of the knowledge and I lack the talent to actually combine the vulnerability or actually made it for a full vector. On the other hand, we have the capable countries, the one with, ha with an internal research team that capable and really to, to value understand the, the vulnerability that offered in the market itself. From a researcher perspective, if you want to sell vulnerabilities, you want to do that for those two groups, either for offensive security companies or capable countries that actually will value your item and will pay accordingly. So how do you get them? How do you get the vulnerabilities? We'll start with the different groups in the offensive security, uh, offensive security industry. We'll start with the researchers, and we already saw there are more than 100,000 researchers that registered and, and reported vulnerabilities. But a deeper layer, we have the high-end researchers, and the deeper layer, we have high-end researchers that working in the offensive security industry, and in the end, we have the smallest group that researchers that are talented enough to find vulnerabilities and actually sell them in the zero-day market. We are talking here about roughly 400 people worldwide. And all the governments and offensive security companies are want to hire those people and offer them quite a lot of money for their item. Um, this table is only based upon, upon my experience. Um, I had the opportunity to talk with quite a lot of researchers in the past four years. And I, can, I, I kind of create this uh, graph by myself. Um, usually when a researcher just start to get known or publish the things online because you don't, don't know the item he holds worth a lot of money. So we publish it or report it to the vendor, one or two. At that point, he, get, he started to get a lot more attention, meaning a lot of companies will offer him job, uh, projects, try to recruit him, and usually they will work in the offensive security industry. So they are stepping into the second phase. They work in an offensive security company. They start to get the, the, the knowledge about the zero day industry. They're making a really decent salary, but they see the boss making a lot more of their findings. They say, look, I can find this RC Chrome. It's worth half a million dollar. Why should I get paid 120 a year? It's not really the numbers, just an example. At that point, he decided to open his own company. So, but what he doesn't know, that running a company is a complicated situation because you have legal, you have to find clients, you have to find vulnerabilities. You don't get paid unless you actually have something that you can offer. So go, time go, pass by three, four months without any salaries, and then they're stepping into the last phase when they started to get more and more side projects. It can be uh, pen tests, workshops, or even starting to work in a, in, in a big company just to get a study income. So if I can have a little talk with any researcher, I can pinpoint exactly where he, where he is on this graph. But again, we are talking about the selling process, so we focus about, about those two steps here, or two, two graphs here, and we will see how you can make the most of, out of it. So what did you learn so far? What kind of products are interested for the zero day industry from the, the offensive security companies and governments? What is the different, and, uh, the, the different products and services that you can offer as a researcher? What is the difference between governments and company? And of course, the researcher characteristics. Okay, let's go over the process. The process is really straightforward. A researcher finds a vulnerability, he, he contacts a potential client, provide an overview, there is a negotiation phase, contract, Q&A, and validation period, and then he gets paid. We'll focus on those four. 
and we'll, sorry, and we'll start with the payments because the payouts are the most interesting part here, I think. So by definition, as a researcher, you want to get paid more than the, bug, the vendor bug bounty program. Uh, in order to do that, uh, it's, sorry, let's start from the beginning. There is no single price list that you can actually find and understand how much your item is actually worth. There is no www.howmuchmyexpertworth.com. So researchers try to understand that from uh, competition, for example. If uh, point to own pay $80,000 for an LPE, this is your benchmark. Or there is rumors because you talk with other researchers that sold those kind of items before. And of course, we also have the hacking team like Incident that we actually saw how much they paid for specific vulnerabilities. The one that actually changed the game was Erodium. They just published the list. In the past two years, until, up until recently actually, this was the benchmark. So every, every time a researcher wants to sell something online or the, on, on the industry, sorry, he go to that uh, a chart and see how much is item worth. But in reality, things are much more complicated than that. There is a matrix for how much your vulnerability actually worth. Uh, but again, different entities will pay different sums for the same vulnerability. Supply and demand is the critical factor here. And of course, warranty and sale model are matters, and I will talk about that in the next slide. But I want to just to hold here uh, and pinpoint a couple of things. First, supply and demand, like any other market, is the most crucial thing, and it, it, this will actually define how much your item is actually worth. Uh, exclusive and non-exclusive. I will show in two slides from now a list of products and their uh, price list. In the past, like six months ago, the prices were for exclusive vulnerabilities. But today, all the items or the price for the items you will see are for non-exclusive. Because the, the, the market changed dramatically in the, six, in the past six months. More and more players, therefore more and more demand. So what is warranty and sale model? There is a company that will pay you, pay, will pay you one, one, one and a half million dollars for an item, but it will be splitted on 12 different um, months, and they will give the vulnerability to their, to their client on day one. So in the end, like, let me ask you that way, how long do you think your vulnerability will last and not burn? And if you are actually going to see that $1.5 million, I think the answer is no. So it's really matter to understand the terms and condition for your uh, specific item. As I mentioned before, this is uh, the payout that I said earlier. All of the prices that you can see here are for non-exclusive vulnerabilities or non-exclusive deals. Um, again, the items that uh, the, the industry is looking for, they are reliable, more than 95, 90% 90 reliable, and execution time that's basically immediately. Uh, just because your item is worth X amount of money doesn't mean there's actually someone that will, be, will pay for it. Again, supply and demand is the most important part here. The market demand change, uh, change regularly, meaning more products will come into the high-end list and go out, out, out of it. And, but as, as I mentioned here, the high-end vulnerabilities will probably stay stable for the next few years to come. So back to the process, and let's go about the contract it itself. The next few slides contain some legal advice, but I'm not a lawyer, so please, if you are studying, to, if you want to get into the zero-day market, please have a really good lawyer with you. We'll start with the spec itself. What is a spec? A spec, you as a researcher, when you want to sell vulnerability, you don't want to give the technical details of the item itself to the client. That's why we created the spec. It's a, pre, it's a guarantee to the end result of, a pre, of, of, of the vulnerability on a predefined configuration. Meaning here you tell the, research, the client itself exactly what your item will do and in which conditions. And then the client will actually test your vulnerability or your item based upon that spec. There is a margin here that you can make an errors, right? It's from 95% to, to 90%, it's okay. But the, you cannot go more than that. If you do, the client will, can actually cancel the, the contract and again, the deal will go off. 
So the spec is the most important part. If you're trying to sell something, be precise as possible because we don't want to make any mistakes in the future, in the process itself. Validation period. Usually we are talking about 14 days and can be extended for 21 days maximum uh, because if there are questions and this, if there is a problem in the test environment, uh, during the validation period, the client can decline the item if it doesn't comply for the spec. Again, the spec is the most important part in the contract. Uh, a couple of tri uh, tri t trips, tips here. First of all, make sure you get access to the uh, client test environment if possible, because if it's a new item the uh, client never saw before, he will probably have difficulties to actually operate and test it. So if you have access, it can make things much easier. If possible, of course, consider to provide the full test environment in, a, in a VM or anything like that. It will make things smooth really, uh, it will make things easier and smooth. And of course, ensure buyer is prepared to test the, the item itself because sometimes the client is not ready and you, s you already send your item. At that point, you'll feel noxious because time ran by and the client didn't start to test the, the item itself yet. So just to make sure everything goes smoothly, 14 days, make sure you have access and of course, make sure the client is ready. Fees and payments. I will start with the saying that there is no such a thing in advanced payment. There's a lot of hustlers out there that will try to scam you. Uh, for example, there is a beautiful vulnerability with beautiful spec, high, high reliability, low execution time, and reasonable price. And then the, the researcher will tell you, look, if you're serious, I need down payment of $5,000. So at that point, you start to get the, the, the feeling that it's a scam. Because if it's legit, if it's really a researcher that finds a vulnerability, he would not ask for $5,000 upfront. Uh, scammers do that, so please do understand that clients will not pay before they actually validate the item itself. There are different kind of payment methods. The first one is called split the risk approach, meaning that the researcher will get X percentage, usually 15%, on, uh, after the validation period. If it was $100,000 a deal, $50,000 will get uh, after the validation period, and then the rest will be in three month chunks. Uh, meaning each month you will get chunks for three months. If the vulnerability is closed in after one month, you would not get the, 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 uh, the remaining chunks of the deal. That's why it's called split the risk. If it's relatively small uh, deal below $100,000, it's only like 100% after validation. What is really important, again, stepping out of the, uh, out of the shadows, uh, more and more, actually, all of the clients are working today with invoices. And that's why cryptocurrency is uh, really a difficult uh, process to do. Because if you're a, a, a legitimate company, to buy a lot of cryptocurrency, like half a million dollar cryptocurrency, it's really a complicated process to do so, and lawyers and accountants will tell you that yeah, you can actually do that. And of course, remind that as a researcher, if you get paid, you get usually you get paid in US dollars, and if you, you should just have a US dollar account to actually receive the money. Property rights. Property rights are basically what you're selling to the client. Do you sell that exclusive or non-exclusive? If you sell your item in a non-exclusive way, you sell them a license. And this license can be sold multiple times or sold only once. It depends on the contract itself. Um, again, it can be sold multiple, multiple, you can sell multiple licenses to multiple identities. But when we're talking about exclusive, you basically sell the entire copyrights of the item. Meaning that if you find the vulnerability, you're not allowed to use it anymore, even for internal research. Uh, a, a good example for that is iOS. If you have an LPE in iOS, you usually use that LPE to find other LPEs as well. But here, if you sell that vulnerability exclusive, you're not allowed to do that. So in the contract, I highly recommend you to put a section that says that you can use it for internal research to find other vulnerabilities. This is really important. Support. 
Support can take many forms, and it's worth a lot of money. There are different kinds of support, from actually um, exploit adjustments to newer or older versions, uh, new vectors, combine that with other uh, vulnerabilities to create chains. There's also, if, if the vulnerability is patched, you have to uh, provide a, a different vulnerability be, uh, to the client itself as part of the support. Another aspect of it is provide workshop, etc. My point is here that if you provide support, get paid for it because that will take you a lot of time. The support process is really costly and uh, it will take you quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of hours during the support period just, make you, just to make sure that you get paid for it. Governing law. Governing law, it's basically if all hell breaks loose, where you can actually sue the company or the client or whatever. Uh, you need to understand that, that if you are an uh, EU-based researcher and you sold your item to U.S. company, and which you, laws you, are you under, the U.S. or the EU? It's really important from your perspective because, again, if things go terribly wrong, and fortunately for me, I never saw that they go that way, uh, but you need to understand what are the grounds for your suit and what laws that you can actually uh, fill. And, and of course, where? Export liability. Export liability is the, basically the Wassenaar agreement. Agreement not equal law. And I'll, uh, I will talk about it in a little bit. But the Wassenaar agreement basically it's for dual use uh, items. Meaning you can use the item, let's make uh, example radar. You can buy radar to put it in an airport to, to help civilian airplanes to land, and you can also use it in air military use and find the enemy aircraft, right? So vulnerabilities and exploits were added to the Wassenaar agreement a few years ago, meaning that if you want to sell a vulnerability, you basically need an export license to do so. So as I already mentioned, more than I think 100 and something uh, countries actually signed this agreement, but each one of them uh, registered uh, the law a little bit different, meaning that each country in the end have a little bit slightly different laws regarding the Wassenaar agreement. So it really depends where you're from and you need to check what is the law in your country and to make sure you don't break the law. Uh, this is just a quote from the Wassenaar Agreement itself. You can find that in wassenaar.org or something like that, I think. And I also try to summarize it up. There are two types of vectors. The first one is if you find a vulnerability and you report it to the vendor, you're good to go, no harm done. But if you try to sell it to a third party that is not a vendor, you are under the exploit, uh, exploit, export laws. Meaning, it usually, uh, the ministry that uh, is responsible for uh, issue licenses is the Ministry of Defense. Because you will need an end use and end user certificate, you will need a marketing license, and you also will need a sale license itself. So it's really a long process. And if you, start, if you want to get into the zero day market, I highly recommend you to open a company as soon as possible and apply for those kind of export, export licenses. Finding the customers. It sounds easy because you said, okay, the demand is huge and the supply is really low, so what will be the problem? There are three different uh, routes that you can take to actually finding new contracts. Uh, the first one is the official point of contact and personal connection. And the third one is through brokers. If we are talking about official point of contact, uh, so some of the companies and even government will go to conferences and talk with researchers and actually uh, offer them uh, a work or uh, to hire them or actually to buy vulnerabilities from them. It could be from uh, business cards, emails, and also cold emails that they send directly to the researcher. And of course, if you are a researcher and you think that the company might be interested, just send them an email. They probably will answer you. If you are talking about governments, the thing gets a little bit more complicated because governments are not willing to approach directly or not willing to talk directly with researchers. So some of them you will need to have a referral. 
someone that grew up in this country or have a really good connection, and he, will, he can introduce you the government organization and actually to establish business there. On the other hand, we have uh, governments and offensive security companies that are more open and they will actually publish here if you are interested, just sell, uh, send an email to this address. But from the uh, terms and condition, don't ex accept, expect, sorry, uh, from governments for the best deals because they're a huge organization. It takes them a lot of time to uh, approve budget and actually to be on schedule. So working in government uh, might seem really good thing to do, but in reality, it's more complicated than that. Here's the list of pros and cons that I, I wrote uh, about uh, official point of contact. You can see that the legal can be either way. It can be a pro if, if you, if pro, sorry, if you are in, in living in the same export uh, lines, meaning that you don't need to have licenses and it makes the, uh, the transaction much more easier. And you also have, uh, you know exactly who the client is, so you will feel a little bit more comfortable. If you are talking about personal connection, it's basically the same thing but you feel more trust between, because you know the person or you know the identity of the client itself, so it will be easier for you and you feel more comfortable to, get, to, to go through the transaction and actually get paid for it. The third one, the third option you have, it, they are brokers, like myself. This is a partial, like this is the service map that brokers usually offer, uh, but we're going to focus only on selling products today. So there are a lot of benefits working with brokers. From the legal perspective, usually broker has more than one identi ident not identity, entity, sorry, entity in different countries. Meaning that you as a researcher, you don't need to go through the, the uh, licensing process. You can sell it in your own country to a broker and then that's the broker uh, problem to actually export it out of the country. And usually the, export, the brokers has those kind of, of licenses. We also have really close and intimate relationship with our clients. We are familiar with the process. We know exactly what they are looking for, what their needs, what, how much they're willing to pay. So we, there is a really um, good combination from uh, working with brokers in that kind of perspective because you as a researcher, you don't have the experience dealing with those kind of things, the negotiation phase, the pricing, the terms and condition, support, etc., etc. And we as brokers, we actually have a lot of experience in this, in this domain and we can help you out with that. But it comes with a cost. How brokers make their money. When I had my own company, I took 17% from offensive security companies and 50% uh, from government on each transaction, meaning $100,000, 1500 out of it was mine. Uh, but today I don't have a company anymore and I actually offer my services for free. If you would like, I'll let, tell you all about that after the talk. And other aspects of it, there are resellers, meaning that a broker can buy a vulnerability exclusively and sell it multiple times non-exclusive. Or, on the other hand, it can buy an, a non-exclusive vulnerability and sell it to uh, clients that only work with him. There are governments and offensive security companies that work with a specific uh, brokers and that's it. They're not trying to develop their own way to, to buy and acquire vulnerabilities from the open market. And subscription is another way of actually get, uh, get paid as a broker, meaning a company or government, usually government, will pay you X amount of money each month and they, they will have full access to your in inventory. If I will try to summarize up all uh, the selling, uh, selling zero days in a nutshell, so first is don't waste your time if the vulnerability is not high quality. Because if it's not high quality, people will not like, will, basically they won't buy it. And you waste a lot of time for you and your clients as well. Ensure your PLC is stable and the, the vulnerability is mature enough. Never try to oversell your vulnerability because it will fail terribly. Again, they will check the spec and decide based upon that. And doesn't, um, just because your vulnerability worth X amount of money, let's go to the supply and demand. You don't, uh, 
doesn't mean there is actually buyer for it. Um, a really important uh, bullet here is on the right side. Finding vulnerabilities and writing exploits are two different set skills. And you, if you are good at one of them, or defining vulnerability, but your exploit isn't good enough, please tell that. It you can actually save a deal. Because clients, security companies, and government have an internal research team, and they can rewrite your vulnerability and write a really stable exploit, and they will be willing to pay the full amount for this item. So this part is, is really, really important. It can save, it can save deals. Um, when you're dealing with exclusive, please, uh, sorry, okay. If you are selling non-exclusive, please sell it to a really, uh, up to three or four trusted uh, clients because today, and I will, I will talk about it in a second, vulnerabilities burn much faster and you don't want to, to sell it like to all of the industry uh, at once because it will burn and the, vulner the vulnerability will get burned and you as a, as a researcher, your uh, prestige or the way people trust you will go down. So uh, another interesting uh, thing here is that workers or clients know the market better than the researcher. Meaning that if you are a really good um, Linux researcher and, you're, and, your, and your client tell you, look, you th I think you should go to, st uh, to start a research uh, project on Android, you should listen to them because they know your capabilities and they understand that Android, it will be much more profitable for you as a researcher. And it's probably more in demand in the market. Okay. Um, exclusive might seem, uh, okay, let's put it that way. If you sell an item in an exclusive way uh, for one client, and then you try to sell the same item in non-exclusive for uh, three other clients, people eventually will know about that. Researchers, uh, companies, governments, and brokers, all of them work together. Meaning that if you will try to sell vulnerability more than once, if you sold it exclusively, we will probably know about that. Please don't try to do that. It will be uh, really bad for you as a researcher to do so, because once they will understand that, you will start with a legal process that you really don't want to get into. So if you sell exclusive, please stay exclusive. And the best thing that I really want you to get, to, to get out of this talk is if you, if you want to sell vulnerabilities and take part of the industry, giving services or selling an end products, please open a company. Because today, the industry itself is again stepping out of the shadow. And this is actually the only way that it can actually work. As I promised, some tips and trips, tricks. So if you want to get started, play CTF. CTFs are really a good place to get uh, the, uh, the understanding of how the zero-day market works because a lot of companies will try to recruit CTF players and they will come and participate as well. They have their own teams and they actually, I think, here in, in uh, Black Hat. Uh, go to conferences, meet a lot of different potential clients. They are here, there are a lot of them. You just need to start talking with people and they probably try to talk with you as well. Get help when in doubt, because we have a really beautiful community that will try to help you if you're stuck in any point of finding the vulnerability or writing the exploit. I actually addressed several different uh, researchers and they helped me quite a lot along the way. How can I help you uh, on your journey? As I already mentioned, I closed my company, but I really offer my services for free. If you want to sell an item, talk about this industry, or any other question you want to ask, I will be more than happy to answer that question. Thank you very much.